I call Ephesians the really good news book. And I can't call it the good news book because that's actually the Bible, right? Uh, the go- gospel actually means good news, which the whole thing is good news. So I can't just pick Ephesians out and call it good news. But my heart really feels like it's actually called the really good news book. The good news is that Jesus was crucified for our sins. He died. He was buried. And now he's risen from the dead. It actually happened. And if you believe this, this is amazing. And you're in a really, really good place. And you should be jumping for joy. No matter what happens, you should be jumping for joy. Um, I don't know if you probably, hopefully you forgot most of what I said last time, but last time I did a really long recap of what Pastor Allen had been teaching. Um, So I was going to do the same thing, but then really the Holy Spirit was like, no, I got something else to show you how we're going to do this. So he revealed something to me in my studies and my preparation for this um, that I don't fully grasp, but I think it's really amazing. Uh, so if you're in Ephesians 4, let's, uh, let's start reading it. So it goes a little bit like this. I, therefore. And we're done. <laughs> well, what, therefore? What's he talking about? What's, therefore? Um, so Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, says, I, therefore. And uh, let's... Um, Let's do a li- just before we get into it. I, I, I want to put a little context to this. Uh, Paul's in a prison. He's in a Roman prison. All right. And uh, so, anybody know who Derek Jeter is? Derek Jeter. Yeah, yeah. This is a different Derek Jeter. <laughs> he wrote this. Uh, The Mamertine prison in Rome could have been called the House of Darkness. Few prisons were as dim, dank, and dirty as the lower chamber Paul occupied. Known in earlier times as the Tullianum Dungeon, its, quote, neglect, darkness, and stench gave it a hideous and terrifying appearance. Uh, This is according to the Roman historian Celeste. Interesting. So that sounds pretty comfortable and quaint, doesn't it? So, uh, yeah, like Paul's writing from these luxurious accommodations, Paul's writing the really good news book. So there's got to be more to this here. Um, So I, therefore, getting back to the the text, uh, I, therefore, kind of means by extension or here's how the dots connect. Whenever there's a therefore, uh, a because, or a for this reason, an and, we got to go backwards. So let's be good Bible study students and go backwards. Turn to Ephesians 3. What is it, how does it start? Uh, for this reason. Uh-oh. For what reason? Well, it looks like we've got to go back again. How about Ephesians 2? It says, and. Uh-oh. <laughs> looks like we're going all the way back to the beginning. So some, something big is happening here. Paul's using four chapters to talk about one idea. So let's read Ephesians 1 here. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and, the, and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is awesome because Alan like, literally spoiled my whole message in a prayer. Blessed be God, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Boom. If if we could afford a new mic, I would actually drop it right there. (laughs) This is like, this is massive. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Two things stand out here to me. Has blessed us and in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, has, and he's in, the, remember, he's in like this, 
the nastiest place you could ever imagine, uh, has been blessed with every spiritual blessing. But it's not just the Apostle Paul. He writes us. So when I was first digging into my Bible, I would have called myself a classical interpretist. Um, you guys can check that out. It's just the way that you interpret the Bible. Um, but the more I study, the more I believe that I really and truly need to ask my Heavenly Father to make me a little child. Totally reliant on Him to teach me, I literally cannot understand even the simplest word in the Bible without His help. For example, the word love. Okay, we understand that as one word, but in the Bible, it's four or five different, different words in Greek. So we can easily misinterpret without God revealing to us what he's talking about or, or deeper study with spiritual revelation. We really can, we can mess it up pretty bad, and I have, big time. So uh, when I try and understand things on my own, it's really just from the book of opinions, and it's really just dung. As Paul would describe things, dung. <laughs> I love that word, dung. D D U N G dung. Is this a spelling bee? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, to me, the fact that Paul writes these beautiful, encouraging letters from prison when just a few short years ago he was leading the charge in the extermination effort against the followers of the way, seems like a heart transformation. And I think this is something that we, should, we all should desire above all else. The ability to be joyful in the darkest, dankest places. The Father says our, Paul says our Father has blessed us. This is past tense. So we've been blessed. Um, so I guess what are these blessings? If, if, I know I'm supposed to be teaching on Ephesians 4, but we're kind of in Ephesians 1 again. This is kind of cool. I, I like how the Spirit just makes me do this. Um, so some of these blessings Paul lays out in Ephesians 1, um, and these are not some like mysterious or cosmic power that are just for a few people. Uh, these are key benefits of being in a relationship with our Father through the Lord Jesus. Um, the, so I got to quote this because I, I found this on the intrawebs. Um, it's, it's from this website called Got Questions. It's pretty cool if anybody has questions. Uh, so it goes like this. In Ephesians 1, uh, the word blessing is a translation of the Greek word eulogy, and it means to speak well of. Since God is the one acting in this verse, we can say that God has spoken good things about us or pronounced good things for our benefit. The good things that God has decreed for us are probably beyond our ability to number. I would say absolutely not probably. But we can outline a few by looking at the verses that follow the statement. So that's like 4 to 13 in Ephesians 1. Uh, the first blessing is... The election as saints. Um, it says that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God has chosen to make us holy and blameless, and because of his love, his good pleasure, and his grace, that's it. That's the only reason. <laughs> what a blessing. Even when we were dead in our sins, uh, God chose us. God chose to extend his grace and to offer us salvation. So, like, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about that, it really brings me back to the, the joy of my salvation. I, I remember where I was in that moment where uh, it was actually like a few months where I was just, I, I like really couldn't sleep. I had to ask Jesus to, I had to beg him at night, I, I need more than one hour of sleep. Really, I didn't, but I thought I did, but... It was amazing. Uh, the second blessing found in these verses, um, our adoption as children. Not only has God chosen us to be made holy, but he grants us full status as his children with all the benefits thereof. John 1.12 says, uh, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we believe the gospel, we receive 
full access to the Father. Remember that when Jesus died, that, that veil was torn. So we no longer have to take it to the priest. And he doesn't have to wear that rope around his belt so that when he goes in and dies because he didn't consecrate himself good enough, they pull him out. We have full access to our Father in heaven because of the Lord Jesus. We're his children. He's adopted us. Third spiritual blessing uh, in verse 6, we're made accepted in the beloved. Uh, the word is related to grace and gives the idea of making us graceful or favorable through Christ, the beloved of God. When we put on Christ, the Father sees his loveliness when he looks at us. The blood of Christ has taken away the guilt of our sins, and we stand before the Father as perfectly accepted. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> perfectly accepted. That's good news. Uh, this leads us into the fourth blessing, Ephesians 1, 7, the redemption through his blood. Redemption speaks of buying one's freedom or paying a ransom. The price for our sins, the payment to buy us out of eternal condemnation. Does anybody really have an idea about eternal condemnation? Like, first of all, it's really hard to grasp eternity, right? Like, my finite mind is very small. But when I think about eternity and then condemnation, sometimes this life gets really hard and really sucky. And it has, sorry? That's why we need them. Amen. But my sucky moments in life are really, they, you can't even compare them to eternal condemnation. So the fact that Jesus died for us and gives us full access to eternal glory is amazing. And it's, again, worth jumping up and down. And it's absolutely worth going out and telling people about. Because if we love those people, if we love everybody, like Jesus says, because I first loved you, we got to go. we got to tell people about Jesus. Um, the fifth blessing, the forgiveness of sins. It's closely related to redemption, but it looks at the other side of the coin. In, in paying the ransom for our sins, the debt of sin was canceled and we were forgiven. We no longer have the burden of guilt for violating God's holy laws. So we're not guilty, and we don't have to carry that around. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The, uh, the next spiritual blessing is knowing the mystery of his will. Uh, that's 8 to 10. God has given us wisdom and insight through his word and has shown us his desire to bring all things together to glorify Christ. Since all of creation was made by him and is for his good pleasure, Revelation 4.11 the consummation of his plan is when everything and everyone is brought in line to glorify him. By aligning ourselves with him by faith, we become part of his perfect plan and purpose. I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty sure I kind of do know about you guys, but I want to be part of that perfect plan. Um, another blessing is the inheritance that is given to us through Christ. Uh, I believe that's verse 11. What is included in that inheritance? Uh, but as it is written, no, no, I, uh, sorry, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's pretty amazing. I know there's some pre pretty creative people here, like Brother Shade is a, a great musician. God's given him a great gift, and he writes some beautiful songs, but I'm pretty sure that even him could not write a song that adequately describes what God has prepared for us. So, again, another great reason to say, whoa, I'm excited. I am excited. Um, one more blessing here, the uh, sealing of the Holy Spirit in, in verse 13. Um, uh when we become God's children, he places his mark of ownership on us, guaranteeing our eternal security. Uh, little side note here, I actually looked up the word eternal, and I didn't make notes on this, but eternal does not mean what we think it means. It doesn't mean forever. It's more of a, I'll just have you guys look it up. It, it, it's another one of those things where at first glance I look at it, I'm like, I'm good forever and ever. But that's not actually what it means. Uh, and I 
uh, I implore you guys to look it up because it, it, it really brought uh, some understanding to me. Um, so this ceiling brings, it, it's spoken of as a down payment of our full redemption. It holds us until the day that Christ brings us to him. To me, this is huge. This gives me great comfort knowing that it's not dependent on me uh, doing anything, but actually I can just have faith that Jesus loves me and is going to, I'm his. He's adopted me. Um, the Greek word here is uh, sfra- sfragidzo. Sfragidzo. It's, it's kind of hard to pronounce. Um, butcher. Uh, so this actually means uh, it, that it, it's signifying ownership and the full security ca- carried by the backing of the owner. Um, in ancient times, the, uh, it, it, it served as a legal signature which guaranteed the promise of what was sealed. So that's kind of what, what Paul's writing here when he's using the word sealed. Um, we were bought by God. Jesus purchased us, and he purchased us with a very high price, his blood. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, so this is great news. Like These blessings are great news and should compel us to do exactly what Paul is instructing us here to get off our seats and to go. Just like Christina's going to Jamaica to proclaim the gospel, Yaman. And walk in a manner worthy of the calling, which is the building up of his church. The encouraging, the edifying, and sometimes rebuking of his bride. This news should not lead us into laziness or complacency. It should, in fact, motivate us immeasurably to proclaim the gospel to those who are lost and hopeless. That's all that this says to me is, this is such great news. I need to stop watching this football game, and I need to go and find somebody who doesn't know Jesus. So all of that, that was very verbose, wasn't it? All that for two words, I, therefore. Yeah. So, Father, I just I pray right now that these words sink in and that, that the magnitude of the words that say you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus sinks in and that we are motivated to proclaim the gospel. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, How do you really know the depth and the blessing of the forgiveness of sins? I know I really had zero idea that I was even guilty until the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. And my parents brought me to church almost every single Sunday in my life until I was like, I'm too drunk to come this morning. (laughs) And then they let me sleep in, but my mom would vacuum the house before she left just to say, I... uh, Stop that. So, this is huge. Anybody know what the phrase dead man walking means? Okay, yeah. Bubs, did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm not supposed to do this, sorry. So, you got 10 words or less. Yeah. Number 10, people that, somebody that is empty, you know, some people are like, they don't have bearing. And within them, they don't have, as we have now, we have Holy Spirit leading us. Amen. And as, when we woke up in the morning, we think of the going to walk. We think uh, 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 I want to win more souls for Christ. Yeah. Uh, we have a plan. Amen. That's not being dead, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, uh, mom, now, when I'm guilty, this is what I want to achieve. But somebody we call him dead man. He couldn't figure himself, you know, uh, maybe probably due to some uh, tormented spirit, mm-hmm. uh, probably thinking things that make them high, that they couldn't reason. Yeah, yeah. Like dead men, they don't have ambition, they That's don't right. think about kids, they don't Perfect. think about wife, they don't have a future, mm-hmm. they just walk. Amen. You just, you just nailed it. All right, sign this man up for the next, one of the next <laughs> teachings. Okay, so thank you, Brother Bubba. 
Great. Um, I love those. That's not my definition, but I love those. Uh, a great definition that I found uh, for dead man walking is a prisoner on death row who is walking to his place of execution. By extension, any man who is in great trouble or difficulty and is certain to face punishment, or any man who is near death or certain to die. Certain to die. So I think that fits in really well. Um, you guys nailed the other side of it. but So by the looks of things, those who are born again have literally been broken out of death row by Jesus. No more near death or certain to die. Thank you, Jesus. I literally went from walking to the place of my execution to walking, mostly, in a manner worthy of the calling to which I've been called. Again, I can't thank Jesus enough <laughs> for walking to my place of execution. And for everyone who believes in Jesus, he literally walk to the place of your execution and you don't have to do that anymore so let's go back to ephesians 4 actually maybe maybe we'll hit this text a little bit <laughs> uh, i therefore a prisoner for the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace this is pretty heavy. Um, walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Well, what is this calling? Uh, I can say that uh, I believe this, this calling is maintaining unity. So let's go look at verse 11 here. Uh, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. That sounds like a pretty heavy-duty task right there. Well, what's this unity? Is this unity that he speaks of gathering everyone together regardless? Uh, I'm going to use some big words here, so this is cool. I thought it was cool, <laughs> but I could be preaching to one. Um, is this unity gathering everyone together regardless of soteriology, which means the doc, uh, what they believe about salvation? Or eschatology, what they believe about end times. Or their theology, um, what they believe about the nature of God. Or whatever other ology you want to throw in there. This is a huge question. Um, Mike, the other day, gave a real good teaching about unity. And about the, bro uh, the brothers and sisters and how there's no longer slave nor free, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, right? We're all one in the body of Christ. So that was amazing. But if we look around today, there's a movement towards ecumenism. A very broad definition of this is unity among all religions. So I want to show, I want you guys to put up your hands here. How many would like to see a Buddhist monk up here teaching? Uh, how about... Uh, Well, that would be great. That would be a Buddhist. That's, yeah, right. <laughs> he wouldn't be a Buddhist. Thank you, thank you. Um, how about an Islamic imam? Anybody want to see one of them up here? Or Jehovah's Witness? Okay, well, so this is a big question. Is, should we be unity because we're all in the same religion? What's Paul talking about here? Well, to me, in my understanding, this obviously is not the type of unity that Paul is writing about. These are all religions, but they're all dead. Mm -hmm. Only born-again followers of Christ Jesus worship a living, merciful, just, and loving God. So biblically, my hermeneutics here, look up that word too. I like using big words. I don't understand them. I had to look them up myself. <laughs> unity is for believers, not seekers, not the nice, sweet old lady who's really nice but does not believe in the name of Jesus. That's right. Of course, though, because Jesus first loved us and removed our unbelieving hearts of stone, we want everyone to personally and intimately know Jesus. 
That's why we proclaim the gospel. But make no mistake, if non-believers infiltrate our gatherings and we allow them to poison the well with worldly beliefs, it gets very messy. Listen to what Paul writes here to the Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 7 to 10. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. Ooh, that's harsh. Jesus isn't harsh. He doesn't come with a sword. That, that was a joke. Paul also writes this um, in 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among, other, among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment uh oh, on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Wow. So and it seems like he's saying anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral is to be uh, delivered over to the enemy for the destruction of his flesh. Hmm. Wow. Sounds pretty judgmental. <laughs> um, and he actually goes on to say, I, I'm not writing to you to, to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person among you. Huh. Who knows that verse? Who, who's ever read that? I've read it like a hundred times. Um, let me add here, because this, this seems pretty harsh, right? Like This seems straightforward. Uh, let me add here that the the excommunication, as you will, is not for the condemnation of the person being exiled. If you remember about the giving up of the flesh to Satan so that he might be saved. It's not for the condemnation. It's for the ultimate purpose of repentance and restoration. The only goal of church discipline is it's repentance and restoration. God always wants restoration. I want you to see here that the Holy Spirit is very clear on what unity is. Those who bear the name Christian must walk accordingly. Not that we won't slip up. That's a guarantee. I slip up a lot. But the proof is in the fruit. Jesus himself, blessed be his glorious name forever, speaks very clearly about this on, in the seventh chapter of Matthew. He says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So even a healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Uh, this to me says that we should be studying God's word and we should know what good is so that we can recognize good from bad. Uh, I have sometimes fallen into the trap, the snare, the fouler snare of studying bad things, right? And I don't need to do that. I don't need to tell anybody to do that. We're to study God's word, and then we'll recognize the bad tree because it's bearing bad fruit. Simple as that. That's what the Lord Jesus says. So Jesus says, to, uh, Jesus says that many will say to him, Lord, Lord, and they'll even do works, like casting out demons or healing people, but they'll bear no fruit. Their calling out and their works are done for their own glory, not for the glorious name of Jesus. These are not the ones with whom we are to have unity. The brothers and sisters who are bearing good fruit, these are the ones that we're to have unity with. So back to verse 11. Uh, uh, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Um, it looks like God gave these positions to equip the saints for work, for building up the body. The body has many different parts, and they all work together for one common goal. That goal is to bring glory to the name of Jesus by bearing with one another in love, with all humility and gentleness, and with patience. That one's for me. Here's where it gets real for me. I'm just going to talk to myself for a minute. Uh, gentleness and patience. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and grant me these things so that I may walk in a worthy manner. I'm thinking of a few different occasions where I showed neither gentleness nor patience with a brother or an unbeliever or sister. Um, how do we do this? How can we be humble, gentle, and patient? I want to give you a, a real-life example here. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had one of those, one of those days, um, which is kind of a funny relative term when you look at God's sovereignty. <laughs> a bad day. Um, it started off just... You know, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, and it just, it kept scratching like a thorn. And this was just really, when I look back on it, it was an absolutely embarrassing day for me. Um, it kind of was like a little child, but not in a good way. Um, when it was time for bedtime prayers with Mila, I was convicted to confess how rotten I had been that day, how I absolutely blew my chance to show others that I was made in the image of God. I was like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro by my emotions and my thoughts, caught in the tempest of situational emotions, not at all focusing on the joy that was set before me because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice and the indwelling Holy Spirit. I just opened the door for the enemy to steal my joy, and he booted it in. So that night... While I'm praying with Mila, I asked our Heavenly Father to forgive me and to protect my mind and to help me just revel and, and love the knowledge that he has declared me an heir, that he has told me that he chose to adopt me, and that that fact is more than enough to sustain and propel me through any tumultuous storm. I asked to have another chance and to keep my eyes focused squarely on Jesus and to fully and completely trust in his process. Obviously, the next day was a total victory. Uh, it, it was a, a complete 180. Um, but I did have to put one foot in front of the other to walk, just like the day before. But there was a huge difference. Well, what was different? Um, just because Paul uses terms like predestined and sealed, it doesn't mean that we sit back and wait for Jesus to do it all we got to put one foot in front of the other. So here's the difference, and I'm pretty sure that it's predictable for, for y'all. Uh, the answer is Jesus, always the answer, and prayer. <laughs> yep, getting back to the milk. When we ask with a heart that's lined up with God's will, we receive. Just like Jesus bears with us, with all humility and gentleness and patience, and bearing with us in love, so he calls us to do with each other. Um, again, in verse 11, I seem to be hammering on this verse a little. It, it appears that the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds and teachers are to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the ecclesia, until, yes, until we reach mature manhood, until we reach the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. That's kind of crazy. It appears again that there's something very special in store for his sheep. We're actually going to uh, reach the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. That's kind of mind-blowing. That's like a hundred mind-blown emojis right there. <laughs> Notice Paul does not write if here. He's laying out the required task for leadership, but it says until we are glorified. Until, not we are glorified, but he says until we reach the, uh, the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. And again, this is really good news. Remember, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. This is like, this is pretty awesome. I think we should pray about this. I'm not right now, because I'm already over time. <laughs> 
Um, why does Paul write these instructions to the distinct offices? Uh, I think the answer is in the second half of, of verse 14. Uh, he gives these instructions so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Uh, when Peter was walking on the water and he was looking at Jesus, he was doing pretty good, right? Doing a miracle. What happened when he took his eyes off Jesus? Sank like a stone. Um, let's see. It also says that uh, he doesn't want us to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, doctrine is defined as a set of beliefs or principles or a system of beliefs. So it's kind of basically just what you believe, right? What do you believe about God? Um, seems as though Paul is teaching us that we need to focus on what he's teaching us. Paul says this to the Galatians, and therefore to us. Uh, Galatians 1.8 says, uh, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Man, again, lots of judgment. Whew. How anti-society. Uh, <laughs> Paul actually writes to the Corinthians about this. Although, it's probably because they're pretty easily deceived. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of weird stuff going on in the church in Corinth. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand one thing here. Jesus says in Matthew 18, Verily I say unto you, shade this for you, I tried to use as much KJV as I could. <laughs> Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So again, there's that, uh, that seed that was planted in me. We got to kind of become like little children. And uh, it's my understanding that we need to totally abandon self-reliance and self-confidence and pray for 100% Christ reliance and Christ confidence. God's word is not easy to understand without being as a little child. Little children are totally and completely dependent on their parents. Right, Alan? In our case, Jesus is instructing us that first we need to be changed, and then we need to become as a little child, totally and completely dependent upon him for everything. The Bible says this, uh, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. And it says this, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Interesting, eh? Jesus wants us to come to him for everything. I used to joke about asking God what he wanted me to do first in the morning, pee or brush my teeth. But the closer I get to Jesus, the more I know that it's actually really true. Every single decision I should be asking, I should be taken to the Lord. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Everything. Our Heavenly Father is literally in everything. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. He's in everything. Whether you believe that or not, that's between you and God. But he wrote that in, in, his, in, his, in his book. He wrote that in the Word. And that's a hard one for most people to swallow. I make peace and create evil. God is in everything. Everything is to him, through him, and for him. Knowing this, Paul goes on to say that we, we are to speak the truth in love and that we're to grow in every way into Christ so that the body builds itself up in love. So because we know all this, every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing, we are to, talk, we are to walk, that is put one foot in front of the other, and walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Uh, at first, it's the uh, office, so the teachers, whatever. It's the office's duty to equip the saints. But the buck doesn't stop there. We each have a responsibility to grow in every way into Christ, to grow so that we can build each other up in love. And here's this misinterpreted word again. What kind of love is Paul talking about here? Anybody know? Greek. Greek. Boom. Agape love. It, and this typically refers to uh, what God prefers. And he's telling us what he prefers. Unity in agape love amongst his body. So I'm going to leave 
I'm going to leave everyone here with a challenge, and I'm going to check up next week. I love challenging myself, and I love challenging you guys. Um, I want everyone to prayerfully consider what I talked about today. I want everyone here to assess their growth process. I want everyone here to come back next week with one area that needs more growth so that we can pray for it on Tuesday nights. And I want everyone to come back with one thing that they can do, aside from coming to worship on Sunday, that will help the body to grow into the unity of Christ. Amen. Praise God.